I started to see that he had such a, a unique and special heart in him. So, all right, I, I want to move forward. I want to move a little bit quick uh, because we started a little late, and I still want to give you guys time to, uh, to worship. I, I feel like today the, the, your ability to sing those last couple songs at the end of the sermon is going to just do more for you than anything else that I could say. So my goal today is to set you guys up for what is to come after I speak. And we have a great band, a great worship set. But I want you to know we're in a series. I'm starting this brand new series. It's going to be for the month of November. And it's called Your Rescue Story. And then the question for you today is, are you desperate for a rescue? And See, this is a message that God has been building in my heart for a really long time. Um, months and months and months ago, I started to, to think about our testimony. And so if you don't know what a testimony is, it's in, especially thinking about our irresistible testimony. And what that is, is, is if I think that Jesus is good, and Jesus has done something in me that is so good, and if it truly is so good, and I tell and I show others what that is, then they should want to have what I have. It's a, it's a, that's your irresistible testimony. If somebody tells me that the best that there is a better donut, that what's the place with the cinnamon sugar donuts? The, no, forget Krispy Kreme. Take that, get that out of here. No, there's a, what's the place? Huh? Donut Center. If you tell me there's a better donut than Donut Center, that's an irresistible testimony. I'm going to go to that place and I'm going to have a donut. Now, how much better is Jesus than donuts? He's, he's a lot better. And so I, I started to wrap my head around, okay, irresistible testimony. And, and then God started to put a, a couple more words on my heart. And I had a conversation with, um, with an amazing guy, a mentor, a friend here in the church, uh, George Draper. And we were talking, and, and the, these other two words came up to me. And it was this word of, of redeemed and restoration. And I knew that God was starting to birth something in me. It was starting to kind of come out and bubble up. And then about a month later, I had this really, really, actually it was very awkward. It was a really awkward um, encounter. I was actually at the gym and it was on a Monday. It was my off day. I was there, to, you know, taking my time. I was working out. I was doing chest and back. It's my favorite, you know, split during the week. If you guys, just in case you care. So I, it's, it's, a, it's a day where I can go super heavy and really just put everything into it. And I was listening to music on this day. And as I was listening to, to just, you know, the radio on shuffle, a, a, a song came up or an album came up and I was interested. So I went to the album and started to play the whole album. And it was by a guy named Zach Williams. And it was a live album that he did. And he shared his testimony. And as he's sharing his testimony, I start to cry in the gym. I mean, like, cry. You guys, who, who, who's been here long enough to see me ugly cry? Yeah, there's quite a few of us. Yeah, I appreciate your honesty. Who's been here long enough to see me beauty cry? No. <laughs> so, so I started to cry in the gym. And I thought, is this really happening to me right now? And I could feel the Holy Spirit stirring up and moving in me. I, I couldn't stop it. And so all, all I could think to do was just, like, work out harder, and hopefully the tears would mix with the sweat and... And I put my hood up on my hoodie, and I just tried to keep my head down. And I just kept lifting and, and working and lifting and working. The tears were coming. And he was telling his testimony, and his testimony ended up calling it his, his rescue story. And, and then after the testimony came a song that he wrote, and this song is called uh, Rescue Story. And I'm, I'm actually going to read the lyrics, and we've got them here for you. On the, on the screen here, so they'll, they'll put those up here for you, and I'm just going to read so that I can flow with it. And it. Here's the lyrics for just the first verse. There I was, empty-handed, crying out from the pit of my despair. There you were in the shadows, holding out your hand. You met me there. And now, where would I be without you? Where would I be, Jesus? You were the voice in the desert calling me out in the dead of night, fighting my battles for me. You are my rescue story. Lifted me up from the ashes, carried my soul from death to life, bringing me from glory to glory. You are my rescue story. And as I listened to that, as that sort of resonated with me, I, I got to, to, to thinking like, okay, why am I just 
bursting out into tears here. What ends up happening with me is that if I have an encounter with the Holy Spirit, and if you're new to church, you don't know anything about the Holy Spirit, that's when, when uh, the Holy Spirit is God's helper. Jesus said when he went up into heaven that he would leave us a helper. And so the Holy Spirit is helping me to connect with God. And anytime I've got a real unique encounter with the Holy Spirit, I end up crying. That's, the, that's my tell. That's sort of the tell for me. And, and so I'm bawling my eyes out in the gym. I've just heard this song. I've heard this guy's testimony. And I thought, okay, what's going on here? And, and I really had to like think about it. And see, a rescue story is a story about the moment when you realize that you have been rescued by Jesus. That, see, I, I know what that's like. Because I, I can remember when I gave my life to Jesus... And I remember in 1996, July 21st, I bent down on my knee. I gave my life to Jesus, and, and that moment hit me. It impacted me. And in that moment, I got the realization of this is the moment that I have been rescued out of my sin, out of myself, and I have now been eternally set aside for heaven for a relationship with God, and nothing can ever take that away. And for the next two, three weeks, every time I thought about that moment, I would break into tears. That, that's where that Holy Spirit thing comes in. And so I really identify with that. And so then as, as Zach is telling his testimony, talking about his rescue story, I started to think about the power that comes when more and more of us have an encounter with Jesus. And, and that started to, to just really, the, the Holy, I, I knew that something was building because of what the Holy Spirit was doing in me. And then since then, I've been working on this series. And, and this week, I had to sit down and I had to ask myself, what do I want you guys to get? It's actually quite hard for me to really articulate the exact thing that I want you to walk away with, that I want you to, to come with. And I started to really examine what is it that I want them to get? What do I want them to understand over the next four weeks? And so here's what it is. I, spent, I actually spent hours on this. Hours on this simple statement right here. Hours discovering what my desire is for you. I spent literal hours just staring at a piece of paper, thinking through what matters to me. And, and this is what I came up here. See, I, I want you to come face to face with what it means to be rescued by Jesus. That's the whole reason that we're doing this. I want you to come face to face with what it means to be rescued by Jesus. See, for some of you, you've never been rescued by Jesus. And so this is a great opportunity for that to happen. Now, those of us that have our rescue story, we have been rescued by Jesus. Maybe you've forgotten what that was like. Maybe you've forgotten the magnitude of that and how special that that was, that that happened in your life. I want you this week, the next week, the next week, and the last week in November, I want you to come face to face with what it means to be rescued by Jesus. And as I was listening to that song and, and just thinking about all of that, that was, you know, that, that, that I heard and that was happening, like in my heart, I came face to face. I remembered face to face. Th this is what it was like to be rescued by Jesus. Now, all month leading up to this, I've been praying for you guys. I just, I so desperately want this for you. That you've got a moment today. Where you, where you just encounter God, but where you come face to face with what it feels like to be rescued by Jesus. And see, something really significant happens when you are rescued by Jesus, when you have your rescue story. See, not, not only does it, it rescue you from wherever you are now, you know, when we think about, uh, about being rescued, you know, I, I think about... Okay, you're, it's, it's the, the last kind of right before something catastrophic happens. You've got no other options. You can find no solution for it. There's no other way to make it happen. You know, this morning I was praying for a rescue as our computers weren't turning on. I thought, Lord, okay, last minute here, this, God's going to come in and swoop in and rescue us and start these computers up. It didn't happen, but that's okay. So when we're rescued by Jesus... Our identity changes. So you have an identity shift. Because what, what happens is, is as, you're, as you're rescued, your identity turns 
to becoming a survivor. So I, I was thinking about, okay, being lost at sea, thinking about the ocean here. I don't know why this example came into my mind, but I was thinking, okay, if you're lost at sea and you're rescued, then you're known as a survivor. You've survived that situation. So I, I want to say that I'm a survivor, that, that there's times in my life where I was completely lost at sea, where I thought that I was going to drown. I thought I wasn't going to make it another day, but Jesus came in and Jesus rescued me, and that makes me a survivor. So if you've been rescued and you would consider yourself a survivor, then let me ask you to do something. I want you to join me. Because see, what I want to do is I want to stand on the bow of the boat and I want to look out and I want to help find other people that are drowning that need to be rescued. It, it's, it's, it's not okay for me to just be rescued and then to move on or go inside and put a blanket on and say, okay, well, I sure hope that they find other people because I, I, don't we want to see people get rescued. See, if there was a boat wreck and there were all kinds of people in the water and you were on the one lifeboat, wouldn't it matter to you to stand out front and to be a lookout and to help find more people, to create more survivors? And, and, and that's where I find myself this morning. Right now, you guys are in the ocean and I'm standing on the bow of the boat and I'm looking for survivors. And so I, I want to know, uh, those of you who don't answer out loud, but, but do you need a rescue story? Because if you're in need of a rescue story, then I'm standing up here and I'm saying, hey, I have a rescue for you. I, I've, I've got a rescue plan. I'm looking for you. I want to invite you into this thing. I, I, I want you to come face to face with what it feels like to be rescued by Jesus. That, that, that's my deepest desire. And a little bit later in this message, I'm going to introduce you to my rescuer. And see, the good news is, is once you've accepted your rescue, once you have that rescue story, once you've been pulled out of the water, then something really, really significant and special begins to happen. See, we're going to go on a journey and that journey is going to be over the next four weeks because it's not, it doesn't end at rescued. See, what happens after we're rescued is, is there's, there's three more steps that come up. You're rescued, then we're redeemed, then we're restored, and then we begin to rejoice. So once you've been pulled out of the water and you've been saved, once you've got your rescue story, once you realize this is where I was before Christ, and now I realize that Christ has, has made himself available through his death on the cross for me. And, and that means so much to me. That's so impactful for me that I want to turn away from the life that I was living. I want to turn away from what was holding me back. Turn away from what was making me afraid. Turn away from the unknown that would come with following Jesus. And I, I just want to catch the, the, the life raft that gets thrown out to me. Today I'm throwing a life raft out to you. You grab that life raft, we're going to pull you in. Jesus is here. Jesus will give you a rescue story today. Wherever it is that you're coming from, I don't know what's going on in your personal life. But you know what? I know that there's some people that have a really, really tough personal life right now. They've got tough situations happening in their life. And they're desperate to feel God, to feel the hand of God reach down and rescue them. And after that rescue comes, God does something amazing. So maybe if you're not kind of motivated by just simply getting rescued, maybe you want to sit in the ocean with the sharks. Maybe you're happy with that. And you don't want to get in the boat. But there's some really good things that happen once you get in the boat. You know, for, after you're rescued, you're redeemed. And, and this, this word redemption, it, it's a big Christian word. It's a big church word. But what does that actually mean for us? So if you go into... Uh, quick spar, <clears throat> and you want to buy, uh, you want to buy, you know, th there's this stuff at quick spar that I, I'm hooked on right now, and it's this, um, it, it's bacon, but it's made into like biltong, it's biltong bacon, can we get an amen to that in here, yeah, and they've got two flavors, they've got honey, so it's soaked in honey, I stay away from that one, and then they've got one that's chili, and the chili one is, whew, Man, that is so, so good. 
And that, it comes in like a, like a brown, I mean, it's just really good. If you, if you go into, actually, I'm not going to tell you where it is in there because it's sort of hidden. Because if it sells out, then I have to wait for a new shipment to come in. But <laughs> that stuff is amazing. And if I walk in there, and that costs 100 rand for a bag. It's cheaper than that. But let's just say it's, it's 100 rand for a bag. But I've got with me a 20 rand coupon. So then when I go to checkout, I go to buy the bacon biltong. My mouth starts watering. I don't even wait till I get in the car. I just pop it open and get one going. And it's 100 rand, and I go to checkout, and I give them the coupon for 20 rand. I have redeemed that coupon. So now I only pay 80 rand for it. Because, see, out of that 100 rand, 20 rand was accounted for. It was already redeemed, accounted for, taken away. I didn't have to pay that price for the bacon built on. And that's the same way that Christ is with us. See, our sin is redeemed. When we go to heaven at the end of this life and we stand before God and God looks over our life, all of the sin, you've got a, you've got a huge list of sin. And it starts from the day you're born until the day that you die and it just goes and it goes. Everything wrong that you've ever done. And it's, and it's there. But there's a coupon. See, when Jesus died on the cross for us, all of our sin was redeemed. You don't have to pay that price. And see, that, 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 if that doesn't make you want to be rescued, if that's not tempting to you, even if you've given your life to Jesus, but you've jumped back in the water and you just feel like you're drowning, there is rescue available to you. And out of that rescue comes this redemption and, and Jesus, not only does he redeem us by paying for our sins so that we go before God blameless, but he also redeems parts of our life. He can redeem a relationship. He can redeem a marriage. He can redeem your relationship with yourself, the way that you think about yourself, the way you feel about yourself. See, uh, over time, we start to build up like this cruft on our heart and in our soul. We start to think bad things about who we are. And then it becomes hard to love somebody. It becomes hard to love ourselves. It becomes almost impossible for us to, to have a good relationship with others. We find ourselves just going to work and complaining all day. It, it's like it, <clears throat> you know, it makes me think about being sunburned. When you get sunburned, the next day, I, I'll tell you, the worst sunburn I ever got was only on my right arm. Can you believe that? Only on my right arm. Do you know how I got that? When I, yes, when I moved to South Africa, your sun down here is different than it is in uh, North America. And I was driving around in Swaziland, and I had my right arm out the window. And guess what? That sucker burned and blistered and everything, just, just here. And as that was healing, even when it was almost all the way healed... Even if I had on a long sleeve shirt, if I just came in contact outside with the sun, I would feel that like burn. It was like once that sunburn had happened, it just, anytime I got near or around the sun, it would just burn. So I would take like a, a towel and put in the drivers in the window to block the sun from coming in and, and making my arm burn. And that's the way that we get in our life, in our daily life, is that we've been burned, we've been hurt, we've got this cruft that's built up in our heart, we feel depressed, we feel anxious, we're struggling with whatever addiction or stronghold that we have in our life, we walk, uh, we go home, the only thing we can do is just get frustrated with our spouse or our living situation, you go to work, as soon as something negative happens or your boss or management asks you to do something, you're just right there, you're upset, you're mad, you're offended. You're easily offended by everything that's happening around you. You've been burned. And it doesn't take anything to trigger that heat to come back up in you. And that's another thing that can be redeemed. See, that, that, it's like God can take away the sunburn. He can redeem the broken in your heart. He can, he can, he can take that away from us. And then if it's not enough to just be redeemed, then... Not only are we rescued, not only are we redeemed, but then we're also restored. And, and we're restored back to God's kind of his first intent for us to be blameless, to be walking in the garden with him. You know, we, we feel like, sometimes I feel like 
I'm walking on gravel barefoot, and I'm dragging a boat anchor behind me. Yeah? And it hurts. It hurt. I, got, I got tender feet, sensitive feet. I've actually got a blister right now, so I, I, feel, I feel this personally. And what God does is when he rescues us and redeems us and he restores us, he puts us, takes us off that gravel barefoot, takes, us, takes the boat anchor off of us. He puts us on green grass, soft, smooth grass. And, and, and we walk and, and our load is light and he, he takes the yoke off of us. And we've been restored back to what he created us to be, loved by him and then to love him. You know, to wake up in the morning and, and feel peace and joy over your day. To walk into work and be able to deal with, you know, an employee or a boss. To be able to deal with that guy that you work next to or that lady who chews their gum too loud. You know, I, that, I've never wanted to kill somebody more than just being around people that, that chew gum really loud. But you know what? I can be rescued and my heart and my attitude can be redeemed and it can be restored and I can come in anew. You know what? This morning I woke up, none of my problems went away, but I woke up restored. I woke up rescued by God. Satan can't take that away from me. We get here this morning, computers don't work. We're trying to figure all that stuff out. You know what? I'm still rescued. I'm still redeemed and I'm still restored. I can come out here and talk to you about how good God is no matter what's going on. Nothing can take this away to be restored into the love of God. That's what we're offering here today. And, and then the only thing that I can think of as an overflow of this is rejoicing. You know, sometimes it just to, to just rejoice and to praise God and to worship Him, sometimes I, I feel like I just need to take time and I just need to put on worship music and close everything else down and just praise God. In fact, you know when the best time to do this is? It's when you don't feel like rejoicing. You see, the rescue has come. The redemption has come. The restoration has come. And now God is saying, okay, you have a role to play in this. Just worship me. Rejoice in me. And so we're actually going to do that. See, this week, I'm hoping that somebody makes a decision to be rescued. And in fact, if, if this room, there's a bunch of you here this morning, it's great. And if out of this room, not a single person claims a rescue, then we're doing something wrong here. Because this should be so irresistible that if you're on the fence about whether or not you want Jesus, or if you've had Jesus but you find yourself you know, drowning again, if, if this doesn't convince you, if this isn't irresistible enough for you, then I don't know what else to do. Because I'm promising you today that there's a Jesus who wants to throw you the raft and pull you out of the water. And then next week, I'm going to teach us about being redeemed. And you're going to walk out of here and you're going to say, I cannot believe that Jesus did that for me. And then after that, the following week, we're going to talk about restoration. You're going to walk out of here being completely restored, being able to address your day with joy, being able to show grace, being able to love and receive love from God and to love others. And then on the last Sunday of the month, we're going to rejoice and I'm going to show you guys a secret weapon. You, Casey and I have a saying, it's a dangerous one. You can adopt it, but it's quite dangerous. And it's whenever things get really tough, we say, I thank God that I get to need him more today. I thank God that my situation is so hard right now because that means that I get to need him even more if I break my life up into seasons and I look at all the different seasons of my life, there's a, there's a three or a four year gap in there, period in there, where I was depressed, I was anxious, I was suicidal, I was all of these things. And if I could throw away every season and only keep one season, guess which season that I would keep? I would keep the one that was the hardest. Because when I look back on that now, that's the one that I rejoiced the most in. I claimed every day, God, I need you. God, you are good. You are big. You are powerful. God, you are Lord over everything. There is nothing that is outside of your dominion. I don't know why I feel the way that I feel, why I'm struggling like I am, why my depression doesn't lift, but I know, God, that you are more powerful than this, and all I know to do is get down on my knees and praise you. And out of that came the best season of my life. 
It shaped me. It prepared me. I wouldn't trade that for anything in the world. It was a season to rejoice. And now I rejoice in that season. So what we're going to do on Sunday night, the last Sunday in November, is we're going to have a worship night in here. And, and everyone, I mean, everyone's invited. And we're going to rejoice. And then as we rejoice, we're going to have people come up and share their rescue story. And so we're going to worship God. And as we worship God, we're going to have people come onto the mic and say, this is when I was rescued by Jesus. And we're going to encourage each other in that. See, this is why I'm so excited. This is what brings me to tears. This is why in the gym, when I was listening to this song, I just broke. Because the thought of someone out here, you guys, and the rest of this city walking through this process and coming out on the other side rejoicing is one of the greatest thoughts and feelings that I have. This is the best part about what I do. I hope for you. I pray for you. I intercede for you. I desire that you claim this. And I, I, I want to introduce you, just in case you're still on the fence, I want to introduce you to my rescuer. All right? Now, I want to show you how good he is. So I've got some, some stories for you. John 8, 1 through 11. Let me get my... So they're, they're going to follow the, the verse on the screen here. But John 1, 8, uh, John 8, 1 through 11, this is a story of the adulterous woman. So let me read this scripture for you. But Jesus, he went on to the Mount of Olives. And early in the morning, he came back into the temple court. And all the people were coming to him. He sat down and he began teaching them. Now the scribes and the Pharisees, they brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. We don't know what kind of adultery it was, but she'd been caught in adultery. Now, there was a serious, serious price to pay if you were caught in, this, in, in adultery. And so they made her stand in the center of the court. That would be, very, I mean, that's, that's shameful. So she's in the middle of everybody. The temple court, everyone's all around, everyone's walking around. And there she stands alone, a sinner, an adulterer. I don't know what drove her to become that. But for whatever it was, her life choices, how she was born, raised, whatever, she finds herself standing there. And then they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the very act of adultery. Now, in the law of Moses, it commands us to stone such women to death. So what do you say to do with her? What is your sentence? Now, they said this to him because they were testing him, hoping that they would have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down. And he began writing on the ground with his finger. See, everyone wants to know what he was writing. We, we don't know. Some people say he was writing out the sins of the Pharisees, but we, we don't know that. That's a cool thing to think about. But here this woman is, the final hour of her life. She has been sentenced to being stoned. She knows that life is over. If it were up to the Pharisees and the scribes, she would be stoned to death. And even if she did believe in this Jesus guy and what he taught, even if she had heard it before, there was still no hope because Jesus couldn't go against the laws of Moses. That's why they asked him this. They put him in a spot where he was going to have to participate in condemning this woman to death. See, this woman needed a rescue. But look at what the rescuer says to her. The rescuer in verse 7, however, when they persisted in questioning Jesus, he straightens up and he stands up. He gets their attention. He's been riding in the dirt. And he says, who, he who is without any sin among you, who of you does not have any sin? Who of you is living a perfect life? Well, you can be the first to throw a stone. Then he stoops down again. And they listened to his reply and they began to go out one by one, starting with the oldest until he was left alone with the woman, standing there before him in the center of the court. Jesus straightens up again. Look at what the rescuer does here. Jesus straightens up, and then in verse 10, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? And she answers. She says, No one, Lord. She's rescued. 
And Jesus said, I don't condemn you either. Now go, from now on, sin no more. That, that's my rescuer. The one that doesn't condemn a woman caught in adultery who should be stoned. And it doesn't mean that your sin is irrelevant and you can go sin all you want because you've got a rescuer. No, no, it doesn't mean that at all. Because he says, go and sin no more. But that's the heart of the rescuer. Let me, I'll, I'll show you another one. This is, this is uh, the story of the penitent, the penitent, penitent criminal. The guy on the cross with Jesus. He had two people up there. There's a good one and, a, and a, a bad one. This is in Luke 23, 39 through 43. One of the criminals who had been hanged on the cross beside him, he kept hurling abuse at Jesus saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us from death. Now, I, I can relate to him because he's up there hanging on the cross. It's not a good experience. And there's this Jesus guy and, and who says that you know he, he can die and then raise himself three days later. who claims all these things, that he's the Messiah. And you're like, get yourself off the cross and then get me off of this cross. But then the other criminal on the other side of him rebuked him saying, Do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? We are suffering justly because we are getting what we deserve for what we have done but this man Jesus has done nothing wrong and as he was saying this Jesus please remember me when you come into your kingdom and then look at what the rescuer says he says today you will be with me in paradise in the man's final hour he calls out to Jesus and just says hey remember me And in Jesus' final hour, he rescues all the way up to the end. See, I I desperately, I want you to come face to face with what it means to be rescued by Jesus. I I want you to to have the outlook that the, the adulterous woman, what would it look like when Jesus stands up and looks at her in the eyes? Do you think that she felt something? Absolutely What did she feel when she was rescued? I promise it was better than before she was rescued. I I want you to, to imagine what it felt like to be the man on the cross next to Jesus and to be told, you will surely be with me in paradise. It had to lift such a burden off. Now, the the last rescue story that I have for you is about a guy named Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus was a a, a wee little man, for those of you that know the story. And Zacchaeus, his story is is found in Luke 19, 1 through 10. I've got the wrong reference up here, but it is Luke 19, 1 through 10. And this is the story of Zacchaeus. And Jesus enters into Jericho and was passing through. And there was a man called Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector. So he was a superintendent to whom others reported, and he was rich, two strikes against him. He was a tax collector, everyone hated them, and he was rich because he was skimming money and he was stealing money from people. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was, but he could not see because of the crowd, for he was short in stature. So he ran ahead of the crowd and he climbed up a sycamore tree in order to see him. Now, why would somebody that's rich and has all the money that they could ever want, why on earth would they care about seeing Jesus? Because even though Zacchaeus had it all, even though life looked okay, and we can ident- some of our lives look fine, we have enough money to pay the bills, we have a car that works, we have a, a healthy family, we've got everything that we seemingly need, but that doesn't mean you don't need a rescue. And Zacchaeus knew that this man that was coming into town, he had something that could fill a gap, fill a hole that he felt. Because even though he's rich, even though... He- He had everything he needed. He climbed a tree to see Jesus. And then if I skip down to verse 5, Jesus, he comes to him and he sees him. And he says, he looks up in the tree and he says, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down. For today I must stay at your house. And then Zacchaeus goes on to tell Jesus. As he's walking with Jesus to his house, he goes on to say, hey, I'm going to sell What I have, I'm going to pay back everyone that I've ripped off plus more. I'm going to make things right. It's not about the riches or the money. It's about you and what happens when I look you face to face. 
And because of that, even though everyone else got mad and they said, why is Jesus entering the home of a sinner to eat with a sinner? Why on earth is he doing that? Because the rescuer had a plan. And he met Zacchaeus in his home, in his private, in his personal. And he met Zacchaeus where everything seemed fine from the outside in. And he met him there. And Zacchaeus, he, he looks at him in, 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 in verse 8, and he said, See, Lord, I'm now giving half my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anyone out of anything, I'll give back four times as much. How motivated do you have to be to give four times as much as what you have? That'd be like if you guys missed a tithe, you would then give us four times what that tithe would be. Amen? Yeah, amen? Yeah, Lord, burden this crowd. No, I'm kidding. So in verse 9, Jesus, he says to him, this is so beautiful. He says, today salvation has come to this household because he too is a spiritual son of Abraham. And then we see uh, this beautiful last verse here. And the, the last part of this scripture, this explains the intent of the Savior. The Son of Man has come. This is Jesus speaking. He has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus has come to rescue. And so today, if you need a rescue, then catch, catch the life raft. Catch what we're throwing out. And then come back next week and become redeemed. And then come next week and get restored. And then show up at the end of the month and for the worship night and join us in rejoicing. This month is the month that your life changes. Not sort of changes, but changes forever. So I want us to bow our heads and close our eyes. I'm going to pray over us and the band's going to come lead us in worship.